All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ridgepoint Church. Uh, we're so glad that you came out this Sunday morning, whether you're here in person or maybe you're watching at home in your living room. We appreciate you guys tuning in this morning. Um, listen, uh, if you're, uh, we would love to connect with you this week, uh, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in person. Uh, we'd love for you to take a few minutes, either right now or maybe after the service, Go over to connect.ridgepointchurch.org. We have an online connection card there. We'd love for you to take a few minutes, fill that out. Maybe there's something you want to share, a next step that God's telling you to take. Or maybe, uh, maybe you have a prayer request that you would love for us to pray for. We would be glad to do that. So take a couple minutes, do that. And if you are relatively new to Ridgepoint Church and you want to know a little bit more about us, we've created an environment for that called Discover RPC. We usually do it after the service uh, on Sunday mornings. Um, so what you can do is you go to discover.ridgepointchurch.org. You can sign up there for the next date that's coming up. Um, but we would just love to facilitate that, whether we do it here in person or maybe, again, if you're watching online and you'd like to maybe experience that kind of online, get those questions answered that you have, we would love to help facilitate that and make that happen for you. So again, go over to discover.ridgepointchurch.org. You can get registered there. And if you got kids and you need child care for that, we will take care of that as well. So get registered over there, all right? Listen, um, so uh, if you didn't know this, uh, JJ and Beth are uh, out of town this weekend. Uh, one of their sons, uh, Jahid, was getting married, got married yesterday. And so they're out of town this weekend, and so we've got a guest with us that's going to be speaking, uh, John Hill, who JJ and I met many, many years ago. I guess it's been about over maybe 10 years ago that we met him over at uh, Auburndale High School. He was the principal there, and uh, uh, we just got a good friendship going. Of course, we've done, as a church, done a lot of stuff over there at Auburndale High School, and uh, in fact, we're getting ready to kind of ramp that back up again as they uh, um, are kind of opening up a little bit uh, after this whole COVID stuff. But uh, uh, we just great, had a great relationship with him. And then when he moved on, uh, which he's currently the deputy superintendent uh, of all the district, um, he's kind of connected with us during this pandemic season. Uh, he's kind of been watching online and connecting with us that way. And so uh, he's come to share with us this morning, so he'll be up here in just a few minutes sharing from God's Word, and so uh, you guys welcome him when he gets up here, okay? The one last thing that I want to share with you is this. We've been talking about this for about a month now, but today is the last day we're going to talk about it, and that is Date Night In. Date Night In is this Friday night. Uh, it uh, gets started at 6 it's for those of us who uh, are married or maybe we're getting ready to get married or maybe we're planning for marriage way down in the future. If you want to be a part of this uh, date night in, basically what it is, we've got, uh, we're going to be eating together. Uh, we've got a catered meal coming in, but then we're going to be hearing from uh, kind of a, a marriage expert. His name is Darren Saley. He's going to be coming and sharing with us. Uh, just kind of his heart, giving us some tools to help us kind of, you know, wrestle the end of this pandemic season, but just kind of push through in our marriages. And so uh, he's, it's going to be a great night. We would love for you to come be a part of that. Uh, if you go to date.ridgepointchurch.org, you can get registered there. Uh, it's $30 for the couple. Uh, and if you need child care, we've got that covered too as well. When you get registered, it'll explain how that all works. But we would love for you to come and be a part of that. And again, today is the last day to get registered because we got to get with the caterer tomorrow and make sure they got all the numbers that we have. So we'd love for you to come and be a part of that. Again, date night in, this Friday night gets kicked off at 6 o'clock right here in this auditorium, okay? So let's go ahead and pray and get into our service. By the way, if you want to give to support what happens here at Ridgepoint Church, there's really two ways that you can do that. If you want to give in person, if you're here in person, you can drop that off on your way out the door this morning uh, in the designated area. And if you're watching online or you're here in person, you can go to give.ridgepointchurch.org and give there as well, okay? So let's go ahead and pray, get into the service uh, it's going to be a great thing, and I'm looking forward to hearing from Mr. Hill. 
God, thank you so much uh, that we get to gather here this morning and uh, that we get to open your word and we get to, to, to look at it together, that we get, to, um, we get to sing these songs together and that we give you the honor and the glory for it. And God, I pray as, uh, as each of us uh, kind of processes what happens today, I pray that you would speak into each of our hearts. God, tell us what's next for us, what's next in our faith. Um, whether it's applying something that we hear in uh, your word today or whether uh, it's something that hits us in a particular song, something, God, that you speak into our heart, I pray that you would connect with us this morning. Through your spirit, you would speak into our faith and show us what's next. And maybe it's that step of faith, of saying, God, you know what? I've been living for myself and now I want to live for you. I want to follow you. And so, God, I pray if that's that step, I pray that you would help us to make that. God, I do pray as, uh, these, uh, as people give uh, to support what happens here, God, that you would use it in mighty ways, that you would use it to magnify your name. God, it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Ridge Point Church. <laughs> How's everybody doing? It's a beautiful day the good Lord has made. Let's go ahead and stand and worship. We need no other hiding place. I hope is safe within your name. This we know. We know you promise never to forsake, but you began, you will sustain. This we know, this we know. I will call upon the Lord for He. Strong enough to save. Arise, your shackles are no more. For Jesus Christ has strong free chain. All of the heavens and the earth. Announce the fullness of your word. This we know, this we know. And every enemy will flee as we declare your victory. And this we know, this we know. upon the Lord for He alone is strong enough to save rise your shackles are no more for Jesus Christ has broken every chain and I will call upon the Lord for He strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain.
I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more. Jesus Christ has broken every chain. I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain.
Well, good morning, Ridge Point Church. How are you this morning? I'm not going to preach with my mask on, 
but I am going to quantify that because of my position as a public school educator and leader. I want to make sure everybody understands that I am following those COVID protocols. I've worked hard to try to do my very best to be a good role model for our kids and for our community. Uh, so I just wanted to quantify that before I end up taking off my mask to preach. Can you hear me okay so far in the mask? I call it preaching. It'll be more like teaching. And if you ask my wife, she said, please stay to your notes, honey. Please stay to your notes today. So y'all can thank God for my wife because she's already told me, stay to your notes. Um, so this morning, um, it's good to be here. And so to quantify, I will take off my mask, but I am following those COVID protocols. We've got social distancing. We've got a good about probably 15 to 20 feet, maybe more here. And um, so I appreciate Ridgepoint uh, following your protocols. I see there's some social distancing going on. And I just wanted to make sure everybody was, you know, aware uh, that, that we're doing that today. Thankfully, I've had a vaccination as well. And, um, but I do still follow these protocols because I want to be a good role model for our kids. So can you all say amen to that? Amen. amen. All right. So I'm going to take this off. I breathe a little bit easier, a little bit better. Get these out. This is the first time I've, I've worn one of these. All right. So it's, it's exciting to be here today, and I'm so excited about the topic, uh, the series, because, um, you know, when, when you think about identity, and, and I was sharing with someone today in, our, in my southern draw, you don't spell it with a T in there, it's an, it's an N. And so when I was typing up, I was wondering why I kept coming up red, because it's identity. And so, you know, you learn something every day about yourself. So I didn't realize I was pronouncing it that way. Um, so if you think about it, there's really uh, nothing more important. I've got some questions for us today I want you to think about with me as we're thinking through this together. Is there anything in life more important than understanding who we are, why we exist, what is it that gives our lives purpose, meaning, and value? Is there really, if you think about it, is there anything more than, important than that? Really kind of working and seeking to figure that out for ourselves. Who or what has the greatest influence on us at this time? Who is having the greatest influence? What is having the greatest influence in our lives right now, in this moment, in this hour, you know, in this particular time in our lives? And who or what is shaping the very core of our being, which is our heart, our mind, our soul, and our spirit? So the last or the past couple of Sundays, Pastor JJ has talked about how identity is being formed uh, and shaped as we live out our lives. Throughout our lives, our identity is being shaped. We're figuring out who we are and there's many factors that play into that. And so I've enjoyed watching and listening to J.J. unpack the idea of identity. And uh, I will say, those of you that are in the virtual world, I've been uh, following closely in the virtual world, and I typically have a cup of coffee sitting out on my lanai. It's kind of a really neat experience. But worship was so much better in person this morning. And there is no more beautiful name than the name of Jesus. That was some wonderful worship. Thank you for leading us uh, in worship and praise today. It was, it was wonderful to be present and to experience that. And so I took some takeaways. I've, I've got a few takeaways. Um, and sort of the way I interpreted what J.J. was rolling out and taking notes. And, and the first thing that I would say to us is, and we know this, but I want us to just kind of context-wise, let's, let's remember this. We are imperfect people living in an imperfect world. And that's going to leave a mark. <laughs> there's, there's just no way of getting around it. Imperfect people, imperfect world, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us are righteous in and of ourselves. So that is definitely going to leave a mark. It's going to make an impression on us. 
And none of us get through life unscathed. And so, as I was thinking about that, you know, J.J. did some pretty uh, cool things. when he, the, the first week, he put the sticky notes on him, the labels, you know, how, how other people label us, how we label ourselves. And so, I've, I've got a few things here that I just want us to take a look at, just to kind of think back. And, you know, there, there's just so many people and things that can influence how we see ourselves and, and that impact our future. Whether it's through words and actions of others, our past experiences, think about that, our past experiences. The good, the bad, the absolutely ugly. You know, the, the, the ugly, that thing that you're thankful that only you and God know about, right? So, you think about the good, the bad, the ugly experiences, traumatic experiences, positive experiences, success. Success. All these things can impact how we see each other. Baggage that we may carry. Titles that we may have. Uh, things that we have to live up to. Um, scars from those bad or uh, ugly experiences. Shame. Guilt. There's so many things. So many things. That can have an impact on how we see ourselves. And ultimately impact our identity and ultimately impact our future. So the first piece of scripture I want to take a look at today is from Proverbs. And I want you to uh, think with me, if, if we're talking about our identity, and we're thinking today about how important it is to, to think about that, to, to, to really begin to meditate, to think about who we are, why we are, what our purposes are, I think one of the scriptures I want to bring to our attention this morning is Proverbs 23, 7. And I really just want us to focus on the first part because uh, I don't really have time to get into the second. It is, um, you know, for as he thinketh within himself, so is he. There's, there's been some books and things written. People talked about as a man thinketh, so is he. As a man or woman thinketh, so are they. And the way I used to break it down for my students and trying to get them to, to really understand the importance of making good decisions, I said, if you think right, you will act right. And so the power of thought, if you think about how our mind and our heart and our soul and our spirit are intertwined, the power of thought is extremely important to how we live and move and act and the direction our lives take and how we see ourselves. So here's a quote from Clarence L. Haynes Jr., a speaker, a Bible teacher, author, and co-founder of the Bible Study Club. I loved this quote. I didn't send it, so um, I'll just read it to you. The thoughts and inclinations of the heart shape the reality of who you are. They shape your thinking, which will ultimately shape your action. That's why what you think about matters. What you think about matters. Because it is forming the basis of who you will become. Who you will become. And so, um, you know, J.J., Pastor J.J., looked at a couple of the apostles, and, and he, as he taught about them, there's some things that we noticed about them. Uh, they, were, they were ordinary men, and, and they had uh, some, they were defined by, by kind of who they were and the actions they had taken. Thomas struggled with unbelief, was known as Doubting Thomas. The Apostle Paul, we know, persecuted the church. So he was the unlikely, the unlikely one to end up carrying the message of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles and to the world. And yet, even though that was part of their identity at one time, we see when they, when they realized who Jesus Christ was, and when they connected with Him, there was a total transformation that took place in their lives. And their lives changed their purposes changed, their mission changed, 
the way they saw life, the way they experienced life, all that was changed and transformed. And so their end, in their end, they were defined by who they were in Christ. Paul, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle that took the message of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles and to the world. Oh, he, he spoke to the Jewish folks as well. But that was his mission. And then Thomas, who once was a doubter, who was struggling with unbelief, he became known as a mighty defender of the gospel and the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. So today, I want to talk to you about another apostle. And when we were talking about this in, in JJ's group, and we were, we were all talking about, hey, you know, we're looking at these characters and how can we talk about them and, and, and study them and learn from them as it connects with identity. When we got to Peter, there was two of us for sure, myself and Michael. We're like, I, I want Peter. I want Peter. And because we sort of relate to Peter, his personality, his temperament, kind of all, all the things that we have learned about him up to this point. And so he graciously let me have Peter, and then I said, okay, but I, I please, uh, if things get hectic and busy, would you please be my backup? And so if I fail in a moment, he'll come running up here, and he'll finish this for us. Um, and he assured me if I just passed out, he would call 911 and then come up and wrap up the thing, and we would be good to go. So Michael is wonderful. Uh, I've always enjoyed uh, his humor and um, just the interactions that we have. And, and let me just say, I, I, I enjoy J.J. and Chris and, and this church. And it's meant so much to me. Uh, our, obviously, our community, Arbondale High School, and my wife. And so, um, so today, we're going to look at Peter. And what I want us to notice about Peter is Peter, we're going to call it Peter the Unworthy. Peter the Unworthy. Um, so I want to take you on a quick journey real quick journey. Um, JJ said, I only have two hours, so we got to go quick. we got to go fast. <laughs> I'm talking a lot faster than my southern way of being. It's, you know, it's kind of tough to talk this fast. I prefer to talk a little slower, but I'm thankful that God has put this message on my heart, so I want to make sure I get it out and glorify His name. So, we're going to take a look at the life of Peter. And as we look at Peter, here's what I'm asking all of us to do. This is what I've been doing. This is what I've been studying. As I study, I look and I see the commonalities that I have with Peter. What is it that I have in common with him? You know, what is it that I have in common with Thomas? What is it that I have in common with Paul? Um, you know, those character traits, those personality types. We may not have the same temperaments or personalities or talents or gifts, but we do have commonalities, things that we can identify with, things that we can understand about one another. And certainly there's some things there we can um, understand and connect with when we study the life of Peter. Now, I, I didn't know this, but Peter is, I, I knew he was significant. I knew that. He was significant. He was a significant apostle. And, and, but what I didn't realize is he is mentioned about 120 times. In the Bible, the, the other apostles, I think the highest number was about 20. And so when you start reading through the Gospels, and, and, and when I was at Southeastern College, uh, you know, we did a study on the life of Christ. And it was so powerful. It was so wonderful just to go through the Gospels and focus on Jesus Christ. What was really cool about this study was going through and tracking Peter through the Gospels and watching how Peter reacted to Jesus and related to Jesus, and even more powerful, was how does Jesus react and relate to Peter? And so it was a wonderful study. And, uh, you know, as I said, we may not have the same temperament, characteristics, personality as Peter. Um, we certainly do have things in common. So uh, the thing I would say about Peter is he was, very, he was an interesting man. He was interesting. Now, he was born an Orthodox Jew. He was born into a Jewish family. And in that time, the Jewish people were being oppressed by the Romans. So this is a man that had no love for Romans. You know, 
because uh, they were being oppressed by the Roman, Roman government. And uh, not only that, he struggled with anybody kind of outside of his own religion uh, that, that, you know, they were not of the Jewish faith or they were not Jewish folks. Uh, he didn't care too much about Samaritans and Gentiles. And, and so he did have some, you know, it, it was typical in that time. He didn't really appreciate or respect uh, or have an affinity for folks of different cultures. Also, Peter, um, he had this personality. He was bigger than life. He was outgoing. He was, uh, you would say he was charismatic. He was one of those guys. He was an extrovert. He was gregarious. Um, as I studied about him, I was amazed at all the things they, they said about him. Obviously, he had flaws. He had some character flaws, and he had some strengths. He was very confident. At times, you could say he was even arrogant. Um, you could say he was impulsive, ill-tempered. Uh, you know how people sometimes they get that fight-or-flight mode? He was not a flight guy. He was a fight guy. And he was what they would consider a man's man. He was a kind of a manly man and a very tough and very rugged individual. He was a fisherman by trade. He was uneducated, but he had a lot of common sense and skill in terms of navigating life. So while he was uneducated, he was educated in the ways of his surroundings, uh, his craft as a fisherman, and uh, he had sort of what we call, as educators, when we started teaching, with itness. He had with itness. He was, he was aware, alert. Um, he also was emotional. He had a big heart. He was very emotional. And, and many times he would jump out there with his emotions. He'd wear his emotions on his sleeves. And he would react emotionally. Uh, he also, he could be very generous, warm, and tender. Tenderhearted. And here's something that, that I think, obviously, we know when, when we know where Peter began and where he ends. Peter was a natural leader. He was a natural leader. Uh, people were drawn to him. He, he, he had leadership ability. And so here is this man, much like us, kind of this gregarious, spontaneous, my dad uh, would call it free-spirited. I remember he tried to pay a compliment to me in front of one of uh, some friends one time when I was a teenager. And he said, my son is, he's trying to think of something good to say, free-spirited. And that's what he said, free-spirited. Uh, and, you know, my wife would say, you know, we've been married 40 years now. Uh, it's been a little bit, but one night I called her because she's kind of looking at me. We're sitting on her, in her love seat and she's looking at me. And I said, honey, what are you, what, what are you looking at? She goes, you know. It's, it's just, I'm just amazed. I mean, you, you, you were so rough around the edges when I met you. And, and look at you now. Uh, I thought, well, you know, the Lord has used you mightily to knock those edges off of me. <laughs> right? And so, but, but you know, she has seen where I was and, and where I've come from as a man, as a young man, with lots of rough edges and Kind of like Peter, I was the guy that would jump out there and say something before I thought or react uh, with anger or, um, you know, get, get all upset, um, gregarious, happy, outgoing, um, not embarrassed to be the life of the party, even though I would embarrass myself. It embarrassed others more than me, but that's just kind of the dynamic. And so, as I related to Peter, you know, the thing that that I noticed about Peter is, at the end of the day, he had, he, had, he had talents, he had abilities like we all do. We all have those. But he was flawed. And the reality is, we're all flawed. We all flawed. None of us really measure up. And yet, think about Peter here. So, so we got this idea who Peter was, what he was like. Um, and so... As, as we look and we come to the point where Jesus calls the unworthy. So, so think about Jesus. I think about how I was. Even though I could be big hearted and kind hearted, obviously I, I was rough around the edges. I didn't have a sense of purpose at the time and, and struggled. And, and so 
Peter was the same and much like us. So I want to start our journey in looking at Simon Peter. Um, and again, before I read this, I, I'd like for everybody to just take that moment and kind of think about, think about yourself for a minute. Think about your personality, your temperament, your skills, your talents, your abilities, the things you're good at. And, and sometimes, you know, think about our flaws, the things where we struggle with, the things that impact us negatively in terms of our identity, perhaps. Areas where we may struggle, things from our past. But you think about that. All that was going on with Peter. And so in Luke 5 is, is where Peter has his encounter with Jesus. And he's a fisherman, and they've been out on the lake, and they've been fishing all night. All night, fishing, toiling, throwing nets, throwing nets, fishing. And <clears throat> they didn't catch a thing. So in the morning, Peter and his brother Andrew, their partners, uh, James and John, they call it quits. They bring the boats to shore. They're cleaning their nets. There's a crowd gathered on the shore. And the reason why the crowd is there is because Jesus is there. And Jesus is teaching to the crowd. He's preaching to the crowd. He's talking about the kingdom of God. And so he looks over and he, he, he gets in the boat, Peter's boat, and he says, push out a little way from the shore for me. So Peter does. And Jesus sits in the boat and he's teaching. Well, after he teaches, he, you know, he finishes and he tells Peter, now think about this, this is, this is a expert in his field. Y'all know how we get rankled when we're experts in something and somebody tries to tell us something. Like, I was like, hey, you know, could you play a few different chords on that bass? He said, Who are you to tell me? I am the bass player, right? So we, we get a little, you know, so Jesus says, Put out in the deep and let your nets down on the other side there. And so they, Peter says, okay, we, we haven't caught anything. I'm going to paraphrase. We haven't caught anything, teacher, master. We haven't, we've been fishing all night. Haven't caught anything. But since you said to do it, we'll do it. So he does it. And then the miracle happens. There's so many fish that they can't even hardly haul them in. And the nets begin to break. And they, and then they're, you know, James and John are coming over and they're all trying to figure out a way to get those fish in the boat. And, and the boat is almost sinking. The haul is so great. And when Peter sees this miracle, I want you to think about this. This prideful, tough, rugged man, when he sees this miracle, he, he knows that there's something different about this teacher. And he immediately falls to his knees. And he says, Depart from me. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man, Lord. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. He recognizes the, the beauty, the holiness, the power, the significance of who Jesus is right there. He, he knows there's something powerful and unique and different about him. And he knows from his upbringing. They've been looking for the Messiah. And so he knows there's something going on. And it impacts him. He drops to his knees. And he says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. I remember when I was confronted with my sin as a 21 year old man when I was a little guy my dad was, we were talking the other day he says man when you were a little guy you go around the neighborhood and preach to people about Jesus but when I became a teenager from about 13 to 20 I didn't follow Jesus but when I was confronted with Jesus the son of God and who he was and how much he loved me and I was confronted with my sin I had a similar experience and Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Lord, we, I, I know I'm a sinner. I want to be like you. This is, I remember I was reading. I, I knew enough to know that the red letters were the words of Christ. And I was reading that. And it impacted me. And my eyes were open. 
And I knew that Jesus was who I wanted to follow. And Peter said, you know, he, he recognized, Lord, I'm, I'm sinful. And you know the beautiful thing I love as I look through these is how Peter relates to Jesus and how Jesus relates. Now think about this. Jesus is kicking off this ministry, preaching the kingdom, and he's calling people to him. Now, if we were human beings trying to build a leadership team to go out and do something and accomplish something, would we pick Peter? I need a leadership team. I mean, uh, can we really depend on him? You know, he gets kind of mouthy. He's a little arrogant. He's a big mouth. There's a lot going on with him. But look at Jesus. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And so, at that point, there begins the turn. Peter begins to follow Jesus. They brought their nets in, it says. They left everything, and they followed Jesus. Sometimes when we read the Word, we're so familiar with it, that we go, like, okay, yeah, he followed Jesus. Yeah, okay, he followed Jesus. Think about that for a minute. Not everybody followed Jesus. They saw him in person. They saw the miracles. He personally invited them. Hey, come follow me. How about the rich young man? Had it all together. I followed the commandments. I've done everything. I'm very successful. Lord, is there anything else I need to do? Yeah, sell everything. Come follow me. So, giving up everything and following Jesus, the invitation itself is powerful, and then Peter's decision to follow is powerful. How am I doing on time? I want to make sure I'm... So, that's where we see, that, that's where it begins to happen. His identity, that's, that's where he's first confronted with his sinfulness, the humility to fall on his knees, recognize his sin, and follow Christ. Now, the next thing that happens, Peter's following. And, and Michael and I were talking about this morning, because we were talking about all the different things that happened uh, between Peter and Jesus and his journey with Jesus. And so, uh, think about it. He, he's walking. Peter's walking. He's following. He's listening. He's learning. He's, he's at times stumbling. There's moments, and I don't have time to go through every scripture, but I went right through. If you go right through the Gospels, you'll see that in moments, Jesus is affirming Peter, and there's moments Jesus has to rebuke Peter because Peter's the one out of all the disciples that's going to jump out there and say something or do something. Uh, in moments where he should be silent and listening, he's blurting out, and there's other moments you know, that he does something and says something very profound. Um, you know, so he's commissioned. He sees the, he's part of the commission. He goes out. He sees the feeding of the 5,000. Um, you know, think about this. He's the one when Jesus asks, who do, who do they say that I am? Peter is the one that says, you are the Christ. You are the Son of God. And Jesus affirms him and says, God has revealed this to you. Peter, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. So, think about that. Peter's feeling pretty good. And so, Peter goes along, and at times, he's affirmed. He's feeling good about himself. And at other times, Jesus has to rein him in and bring him back. Um, I liked one of the analogies Michael gave me this morning. And I said this to my wife this morning. When you watch Peter, even as he's following Jesus, he's following. He stumbles. He falters a little bit. He struggles. He gets affirmed. He does some great things. But the thing I love about Peter is he is all in all the time. He's all in. He's swinging for the fences. He, he's, not just, he's not just there to be there. He's there to be all in all the way 100%. And I admire and appreciate that about Peter. So, you know, he has some experience that the other dis the disciples don't get to experience. He and two others get to see Jesus transfigured. You know, and Jesus is talking to Moses and Elijah. And Peter's taking it all in. And, 
instead of listening and, and really seeing and hearing what's going on, he, he blurts out and just busts into their come. Hey, I'm going to build. I think it would be good if we build a little couple of some, some tabernacles here for each of he starts He starts wanting to plan and do and, and lead. And, 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 and Jesus, you know, is probably his son. Uh, Peter. He's constantly having to ring Peter in. And then so we get finally to the Lord's Supper. And we're getting to the point where, and this is where I want us to kind of relate and think about it. Getting to the point where we're getting close to that time where Peter really fal falters. He really struggles. And, and um, he does something that is, is just, um, in his mind, and probably in others, un un unspeakable. It's, so we're at the Lord's Supper, and Jesus breaks the bad news to Peter. Peter, you'll deny me three times. Now, he's seen Jesus feed 5,000. He's seen the miracle of the fish. He's seen him heal lepers. And, and he's seen him cast out demons. And he understands the authority of Christ. And Jesus tells him, you're going to deny me. And what does Peter do? Not me. Uh-uh. I got you. I got your back. I got your back. I will, I will go to jail with you. I'll be there. You go to jail, I go to jail. Y'all ever had a friend? You remember when you were kids? Hey, yeah, you stand up to the guy. You stand up to him. I'll be there. You turn around, there ain't nobody there but you. Right? So, I'll even, Jesus, I'll even die for you. I'll even die for you. So, Emotion, right? He loves you. That's pure emotion. That's not really thinking through the reality. So what happens? Jesus gets arrested. Right? He goes before the Sanhedrin. He's in front of his accusers. And Peter follows. And he's out there, and it says he's by a fire, and, and someone says, hey, aren't you one of, aren't you one of his followers? What does, Jesus, what does Peter do? No. No, 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 not me. And then the, a few minutes later, yeah, you, yeah, I saw you with him. I saw you with him. You, you were with him. No, not me. Third time. You're a follower of, you're, you're one of his followers. Very adamant denial. No, I don't know him. I wasn't with him. He's, no. And then the rooster crows. And then he remembers what Jesus told him would happen. What would happen? Jesus foretold what would happen. And Peter, like any of us, when we realize what we've done is utterly devastated. Utterly devastated. It says that he went out and he wept bitterly. Now, bitterly to me doesn't connotate, it connotates falling on the ground, weeping. So hard, you know, like the kids, when you, you look, can't get your breath, just utterly devastated. That he betrayed Jesus. Now, that, that's not a little one. Up to then, he's had some hiccups and some moments. Jesus has corrected him. You know, Jesus had to tell him once, get behind me. Get behind me, Satan. You, you know, Jesus was telling him how he was going to have to die. And Peter's like, no, you, you got a kingdom to run here. I mean, you got to do something by these Romans. We, we got things to do and things to accomplish. And yet, now he's betrayed him. Now, think back to the beginning of what we started talking about today. Our experiences and how they impact how we see ourselves. How our experiences sometimes can define who we are. He failed. I failed Jesus. And then Jesus is crucified. And he's, he's dead. 
and he's buried. And Peter, can you imagine? I can't even imagine trying to think through that and imagine that. What all the thoughts that must have gone through their mind. And then Peter gets the news. The stone's been rolled away. He's not in the tomb. He runs to, he runs to the tomb. He looks in. He sees that Jesus isn't there. And as you move forward, two times Jesus revealed himself, he, himself to, the, to the disciples. And yet, as we move toward this last part that I want to show you today, Peter says at some point, well, you know, obviously Jesus has revealed himself twice now, but hey guys, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to, I've got to do something that I know. I'm only imagining for him. He, he had to find something that just maybe had some sense of normalcy for him because all of his hopes, everything that he had been doing for three years comes crashing down when he denies Jesus. And, and he, he, he's really kind of bewildered, so I'm going to go out fishing. Here's the good news for us. He's out fishing. They're fishing. They look on the shore. There's, there's a guy out on the shore. He's got a little fire going. And he calls to him, hey, guys, y'all caught anything? No, we ain't caught anything. Cast on the other side. Another big catch of fish. Once Peter realizes who Jesus is, what, what does he do? And he's out of that boat and headed to the shore. Once he realizes this is Jesus, he's out of the boat and he's headed to the shore. And they come, and he sits down with Jesus. And they eat some fish. Bring those fish in. Actually, Peter was the one that went back and drugged the fish in in, in one of the Gospels. So, so now he's there with Jesus. Think about this. You know how hard it is when you mess up, to fess up sometimes? Wondering where I stand with this. Where, where do I stand? And so I love this as we look, um, as we look at John fifteen nineteen. This is where Jesus reinstates, restores Peter, and it, it's very beautiful. So when they had finished eating, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus says, take care of my sheep. The third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter's hurt. Now, he knows what he's done, but he's already told Jesus twice, yes, Lord, I love you. So he's hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, I, I, I found this interesting. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Now, think about that. We say, what do we want on the outside? But on the inside, the beautiful thing is Jesus knows our hearts. God knows our inner being. He knows what's on the inside. So we can be perfectly honest with him because he knows. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you were old, when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. The kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. So, starts with Peter following Jesus, recognizing the sin and following Jesus along. Jesus is teaching him, correcting him, loving him, guiding him. Peter struggles at different times, and then Peter falters and falls. 
And in his despair and in his desperation, Jesus says, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I do. Good, good. Then feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Take care of my sheep. And follow me. He restores Peter. And now Peter, instead of having been defined by his failures, his struggles, ultimately ends up in his life being defined by the Lord Jesus Christ and who Jesus was in him. And the fact that he, Peter, was the leader of the apostles and the leader of the early church. And Peter, after that, feared no man. One of the things that I loved was during Pentecost, after Jesus had called them together and told them to go wait because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, it is Peter who walks out among all those people and those men and preaches a powerful sermon preaches a powerful sermon without any fear or hesitation, totally fearless to follow Christ and to preach the good news and to preach the kingdom of God. His identity, what he knew about himself was that Jesus was his Lord and Savior, and he now identified with Jesus, called to go forth and establish the early church and to preach the gospel and to share the good news. And he lives his life doing so. And in the end, glorifies God through it all. And we call him today Saint Peter. He's known as Saint Peter. Have you ever heard, who's, when I get to heaven, who's going to be standing at the pearly gates, Right? We, we, know, we have all these things about Peter now, but, but we don't call him Peter the unworthy. And so what's the good news for us today? This is the whole point of the message on identity. No matter what our past, no matter what's going on in our present, no matter what other people say about us, no matter what we feel about ourselves, we have an enemy of our soul that likes to remind us, hey, you remember back then when you did this or that? You're not worthy. You're no good. You know what we can say? You're right. I'm not. My righteousness is as filthy rags. I'm a human being. I'm frail. I'm weak. I have faults. I make mistakes. Sometimes I've made some bad choices. But I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I am the righteousness of God. I can come boldly to the throne of grace because I have repented of my sin. I have humbled myself. I have recognized that I am a sinner. And I'm saved by grace. And I put everything into to focusing on following Jesus. So here's my encouragement for us today. The older I get, you know, you would think by the time we get to... 61 years old, we know who we are. Most days I do. But sometimes there's things that come up that will knock you off your feet a little bit. And we have to stay focused. We have to stay in God's Word. We want to continually hear what Jesus is saying about us. Do you remember the questions we asked at the beginning? Who is influencing what you think about ourselves. Who in, who's influencing us in terms of how we see ourselves? And I'm encouraging everybody. If you're a follower of the Jesus Christ, if Jesus Christ and, you, and you have given him your life and you are, you are saved and your purpose is now to follow Christ and live for him, then the good news is you can just simply pause, pray, surrender, and make sure that we connect with our Savior because He tells us who we are. It's His Word. And so, at my age, I've learned my identity is in Christ. No matter what anyone else says, no matter what mistakes we make, we have to cling to our Savior. Cling to the old rugged cross and stay in God's Word. If you don't know Jesus, it's like I tell my friends, 
Go back and take a look at Jesus. Go back and take a hard look at Jesus. Because Jesus is the Son of God. He is the way. He says, I'm the truth, the life, and the way. No man comes to the Father but by me. So, amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and your goodness. Father, today I pray that your word goes forth, touches our hearts and minds, so that we may see you. We may desire to follow you. That we would give our hearts and our minds to our Lord Jesus Christ. Focus our attention on him and let Jesus be the center of our identity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, let's give Mr. Hill a hand. Thank you so much for sharing with us, sir. I love his heart, and I love um, just being able to interact with him and hear what God's doing in his life. And uh, I, I just love what he does for our community. Uh, just a great guy. So thanks again for sharing with us. Um, Listen, I want to remind you, today, again, is the last day to get uh, registered for uh, the Date Night Inn. That's at date.ridgepointchurch.org. Otherwise, we'll see you next Sunday at 1010. All right?